The Cube presents Ignite 22. Brought to you by Palo Alto Networks. Welcome back to Las Vegas, everyone. We're glad you're with us. This is The Cube live at Palo Alto Ignite 22 at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Lisa Martin here with Dave Vellante, day one of our coverage. We've had great conversations. The cybersecurity landscape is so interesting, Dave. It's such a challenging problem to solve, but it's so diverse and dynamic at the same time. You know, Lisa, The Cube started in May of 2010 in Boston. We called it the Chowda event. <laughs> Chowda and Lobster, <laughs> it was at EMC World 2010. BJ Jenkins, who was here of course, was a longtime friend of theCUBE and made the, made the transition into, from, well, it's still data, from yeah. data to, to cyber, so. True, and BJ is back with us, BJ Jenkins, president of Palo Alto Networks. Great to have you back on theCUBE. It is uh, great to be here in person on <laughs> theCUBE in Vegas. Yes, yes it's awesome. and we can tell by your voice will be, will be gentle. You've, you've been in Vegas, typical Vegas occupational hazard of losing the voice. Yeah, it was uh, one of the benefits of COVID. I didn't lose my voice at home sitting talking to a TV. You lose <laughs> it when you come to Vegas. But exactly. it's a small price to pay. So, so things kicked off yesterday with the Partner Summit. You had a keynote then, you had a customer, a CISO on stage. You had a keynote today, which we didn't get to see. But talk to us a little bit about the lay of the land. What are you hearing from CISOs, from CIOs, as we know, security is a board level conversation. Yeah, I, you know, it's been an interesting three or four months here. Let me start with that. I think uh, cybersecurity in general, is still front and center on CIOs and CISOs minds. It has to be, um, if you saw Wendy's presentation today and the threats out there, companies have to have it front and center. I, I do think um, it's been interesting though with the macro uncertainty, uh, we've taken to calling this year the revenge of the CFO. <laughs> and you know, these deals in cybersecurity are still a top priority, but they're getting finance and procurement uh, scrutiny. Um, which I think in this environment is a necessity, but it's still a you know number one, number two imperative, uh, no matter who you talk to. In well, my mind, it was interesting what Nikesh was saying in the last conference call. Hey, we just have to get more approvals. We know this. We're we're bringing more go-to-market people on board. We we have, we're filling the pipeline because we know they're going to split up deals. Big deals go into smaller chunks. So the question I have for you is: is how are you able to successfully integrate those people? so that you can get ahead of that sort of macro transition. Yeah, I, you know, I think um, there's two things I'd say about uncertain macro situations, and Dave, you know how old I am. I'm pretty old, I've been through a lot of cycles. And in those cycles, I've always found stronger companies with stronger value propositions separate themselves actually in uncertain uh, economic times. And so I think there's actually an opportunity here the message tilts a little bit though, where it's been about innovation and new threat vectors to one of, you have 20, 30, 40 vendors, um, you can consolidate, uh, become more effective in your security posture and save money on your TCO. So one of the things is we bring people on board, it's uh, training them on that business value proposition. How do you take, a customer who's got 20 or 30 tools, take them down to five or 10 where Pelo is more central and strategic and be able to demonstrate that value. So we do that through, um, you know, we're making a huge investment in our people, um, but macroeconomic times also puts some stronger people back on the market and we're able to incorporate them, them into the business. What are the conditions that are necessary for that consolidation? Like I would imagine if you're, if you're a big customer or a big you know, competitor of yours that that migration is going to be harder than if you're dealing with lots of little point tools. Do those, do those point tools, are they sort of, is it the end of the subscription? Is it just uh, stuff that's off the books now? What's, what's the condition that is ripe for that kind of consolidation? Look, at, I, I think um, the challenge coming into this year was skills. And so customers had all of these point uh, products. It required a lot more human intervention, as Nikesh was talking about, to integrate them or make them work. And as all of us know, finding people with cybersecurity skills over the last 12 months has been incredibly hard. That drove, if you, you know, if you think about that, a CIO and a CISO sitting there going, I have all, all this investment in tools, I don't have the people to operate them, what do I need to do? Um, what we tried to do is elevate that conversation because 
in a customer, everybody who's bought one of those, they, they bought it to solve a problem. And there's people with affinity for that tool. They're not just going to say, I want to get consolidated and give up my tool. They're going to wrap their arms around it. And so what we needed to do, and this changed our ecosystem strategy too, how we leverage partners. We needed to get into the CIO and CISO and say, look at this chaos you have here and the challenges around people that it's, it's presenting you, we can help solve that by, by standardizing, consolidating, taking that integration away from you as Nikesh talked about, and making it easier for your, your high-skilled people to work on high, skill, you know, high challenges in L there. Let account. chaos reign and then reign in the chaos. <laughs> yes. okay, Andy Grove. <laughs> yes. I was looking at some stats uh, that there's 26 million developers but less than three million cybersecurity professionals. Yes. Talked about that skills gap and what CISOs and CIOs are facing. Is, do you consider, from a value prop perspective, Palo Alto Networks to be a, a facilitator of helping organizations deal with that skills gap? I think there's a short term and a long term. Um, I think that Kesh today talked about the long term that we'll never win this battle with human beings. We're going to have to win it with automation. That, that's the long term. The short term right here and now is that people need people with cyber security skills. Now, what we're trying to do um, you know, is uh, multifaceted. We work with universities to standardize programs to develop skills that people can come into the marketplace with. Um, we run our own programs inside the company. We have a cloud academy program now where we take people high aptitude uh, for sales and technical aptitude and we will put them through a uh, six month boot camp on cloud and they'll come out of that ready um, to, to really work with the leading experts in cloud security. Um, the third angle is partners, right? There, there are partners in the marketplace who want to drive their business into high services areas. They have people, they know how to train. We give them, we partner with them to give them training. Hopefully that helps solve some of the short-term gaps that are out there you know, today. So you made the jump from data storage to security and yeah. you know, <laughs> network security, all kinds of security. Yeah. What was that like? What, you must have learned a lot in the last better part of a decade. Uh, yeah, take, it's, take us um, through that. Uh, you know, so the first jump was from EMC. I was 15 years there to be CEO of Barracuda. And you know, it was interesting because EMC was you know, large enterprise for the most part. Uh, at Barracuda we had you know, 250,000 small and mid-sized yep. enterprises. And it was, it's interesting to get into security in small and mid-sized businesses because you know, Wendy today was talking about nation states. Yep. For small and mid-sized business, it's common thievery, right? It's ransomware, it's, and, and, and those customers don't have, you know, the human and financial resources to keep up with the threat vectors. So, you know, Nikesh talked about how it's taken him four and a half years and to get into cybersecurity. I remember my first week at Barracuda, I was talking with a customer who had, you know, breached, <laughs> data shut down. There wasn't much Bitcoin back then, so it was just a pure ransom and I'm like, wow, this is you know incredible industry, and um, so it's been a good you know transition for me. I, I still think data is at the heart of all of this, right? And I, I have always believed there's a strong connection between uh, the things I learned growing up at EMC and what I put into practice today at Palo Alto Networks. And how about the culture? Because I, you know I know have observed the EMC culture, yeah. and you were there in really the heyday, yeah. right? Which was an awesome place. <laughs> and it seems like Palo Alto, obviously different times, but you know similar you know, like laser focus on solving problems. You know, obviously great you know, value sellers. You know, you guys aren't the commodity yeah. or product, but there seem to be some similarities from afar. I don't know Palo Alto as well as I know I think EMC, there, there's a lot. When I uh, joined e, uh, EMC, it was about, it was two billion in, yeah. in revenue. And I think when I left, it was over 20, 20 yeah. 21. And you know, we're at, uh, you know, hopefully five, five, five uh, in revenue and, um, I, I feel like it's this very similar. There's a sense of urgency. There's an incredible uh, focus on the customer. Um, I, uh, you know, Nir and Moshe are definitely different individuals, but they're both same kind of disruptive Israeli force out there driving the business. 
um, there are a lot of similarities. I, you know, the passion, I feel privileged as a you know, go to market person that I have this incredible portfolio to go you know, work with customers on. It's a lucky uh, position to be in. But very, I feel like it is a movie I've seen before. Yeah, and, but, and the, of course the, the challenges from the, 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 the target that you're disrupting is different. It was, you know, EMC had a lot of big, you know, IBM yeah, obviously right. was a you know, bigger target, whereas yeah. you got thousands of you know, smaller companies. Yes. And, uh, and so that's a different dynamic, but that's why the consolidation play is so important. I, look at that, it's why I joined Palo Alto Networks. When I was at Barracuda for nine years, um, it just fascinated me that there was 3,000 plus players in security, and why didn't security evolve like the storage market did or the server market or network Networking, where yeah, right. you know two or three big gorillas came to to dominate those markets and it's I think it's what Nikesh talked about today. There was a new problem in best of breed it was always best of breed. You can never in security go in and uh, you know say, hey it's good I saved us some money but I got the third best product in the marketplace. <laughs> um, and there was that kind of gap between products. Um, I, I th believe and why I joined here, I think this is my last gig, is uh, we have a chance to change that. And this is the first company, as I look from the outside in, that had best of breed, as you know, Nikesh said, 13 categories yeah. in the, um, you. that you know, were in the leader's quadrant. And it's a conversation I have with customers. You don't have to sacrifice best of breed, but get the benefits of a platform. And I, I think that resonates today. I think we have a chance to change the industry. Um, from that viewpoint. Give us a little view of the voice of the customer. You had, it was it Sabre? Yeah. That was on Scott the CISO. Scott Moser, the CISO from Sabre. Give yep. us a view, what are you hearing from the voice of the customer? Obviously they're quite a successful customer, but challenges, concerns, the partnership? Yeah, look at, I think um, security is similar to industries where we come up with magic marketing phrases and you know <laughs> things to you know, make you want to procure our solutions. You know, zero trust is one and, you know, you'll talk to customers and they're like, okay, yes. And, you know, the government, right? Joe, Joe Biden's putting out zero trust executive orders. And the, the problem is, if you talk to customers, it's a journey. They have legacy infrastructure. They have business drivers that, um, you know, they just don't deal with us. They've got to deal with the business side who's trying to make the money that keeps the, the company going. And it's, it's really helped them draw a map from where they're at today to zero trust or to a better security architecture or, you know, they're moving their apps into the cloud. How am I going to migrate, right? Again, that discussion three years ago was around lift and shift, right? Today it's about, well, no, I need cloud native developed apps to service the business the way I want to I want to service it. How do I so I, I think there's this element of a trusted partner and relationship. And again, I think this is why you can't have 40 or 50 of those. You got to start narrowing it down if you want to um, be able to meet and beat the threats that are out there for you. So I, you know, the customers, and I see a lot of them, it's here's where I'm at help me get here to a, to a better position. And they know it's, um, you know, you, it, uh, Scott said in our keynote today, you don't just, you know, have layer three firewall policies and decide, okay, tomorrow I'm going to go to layer seven. That, that's not how it works, right? There's, and, and by the way, these things are in mission critical type areas. So there's got to be a game plan that you help customers go through yeah. to get there. Definitely. Last question, my last question for you is, is, you know, security being a board level conversation. I was reading some stats from a survey, I think it was the What's New in Cyber survey that, that Palo Alto released today, that showed that while significant numbers of organizations think they've got a cyber resiliency playbook, there's a lot of disconnect or lack of alignment at the boardroom. How are you in those conversations? How can you help facilitate that alignment between the executive team and the board when it comes to security being so foundational to any business? Yeah, it's, um, I've been on three, four public company boards. I'm on, I'm on two today. And um, I would say um, four years ago, uh, this was a, almost a taboo topic. It was a put your head in the sand and 
pray to God, nothing happened. And, you know, the world has changed significantly. And because of the number of breaches, the impact it's had on brand, boards have to think about this in duty of care and their fiduciary duty. Okay, so then you start with a board that may not have the technical skills. The first problem the security industry had is how do I explain your risk profile? in a way you can understand it. I'm, I'm on the board of Generac that makes home generators. It's a manufacturing you know, company, but they put Wi-Fi modules in their boxes so that the dealers could help do the maintenance on them. And all of a sudden these things were getting attacked, right? And they were being used for bot attacks. Yeah. Everybody on their board had a manufacturing background. Ah. So how do you help that board understand the risk they have. Um, and th that's what's changed over the last four years. It's a constant discussion. It's one I have with CISOs where they're like, help us put it in layman's terms so they understand, they know what we're doing and they feel confident, but at the same time understand the marketplace better. And that's a journey for us. That Generac example is a great one because you know, think about IOT technologies, yeah. they've historically been air-gapped Yes. by design, and all of a sudden the business comes in and says, hey, we can put Wi-Fi in there. You know, Connect it to a home yeah, Wi-Fi yeah, system yeah. that... Awesome, uh, yeah. make our lives so much easier. Yeah. Next yeah. thing you know, it's being used to attack. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why, as you go around the world, do you, are you discerning, I know you were just in Japan, are you discerning significant differences in sort of attitudes toward, toward cyber, whether it's public policy, you know, things like regulation, you, where you, you, they don't want you sharing data, but as, as a cyber company, you want to share that data with you know, public I, and private? Look, at, I, I think um, around the world, we see incredible government activity, first of all, and I think given the position we're in, we get to have some unique conversations there. Um, I, I would say worldwide security is an imperative. I, no matter where I go, you know, it's in front of everybody's mind. Um, the, on the, the governance side, it's really, what do we need to adapt to make sure we meet local regulations? And I, and I would just tell you, Dave, there's ways um, uh, when you do that, and we talk with governments that um, because of how they want to do it, reduce our ability to give them full insight into all the threats and how we can help them. And I do think over time, governments understand that we can not, anonymize the data, there's, but that, that's a work in pro process, definitely. There is a balance. We need to have privacy, we need to have you know, uh, personal security for people, but there's ways to collect that data in an anonymous way and give better security insight back into uh, the architectures that are out there. All right, a little shift the gears here, a little sports <laughs> question. We've had some great Boston <laughs> sports guests on theCUBE, right? I mean, Randy Seidel, we were talking about right. him. Uh, you know, Peter McKay, sneak, yeah. I guess he's a competitor now, but you know, there's no question about- got a little about, funding today, I saw that. Yeah, yeah there's no, there's a, down round, but they still got a yeah, lot of money. No, they hey, got a I lot could of not money. have a down round yeah. where they were, but, yeah. um, but, but so, and then, but, but actually, you know, he, he was on several years ago, and it was around the time they were talking about trading Brady. He said, never trade Brady. And he got that right. So we, I think we can agree Brady's the GOAT. Yes. The, big, the big question I have for you is Belichick. Do you have a question? Has your, has your belief in him as the greatest coach of all time wavered? <laughs> You know, now that, no, okay, never. so weigh never. in on that. Never, he said. Still the go. I'll give you my best, you know, never. In <laughs> <laughs> Bill we trust. Okay, so, still. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I, you know, the, the NFL um, is a unique property that's designed for parity and de is designed, I mean, actively designed to not let Mr. Kraft and Bill Belichick do what they do every year. The, I feel privileged as a Boston sports fan that in our worst years, we're in the seventh playoff spot. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, and I have a lot of family in Chicago who would kill for that position, okay. by the way. And, uh, you know, they're in perpetual rebuilding. And uh, so, uh, look, at I think he, you know, the way he's been able to manage the cap and the skill levels, I think we have a top five defense. There's different ways to win titles, and if I, you know, remember in Brady's last title with Boston, the defense won us that Super Bowl. It well, was, thanks for weighing in on that yeah. because there's a lot of crazy talk going on 
Like, hey, if he doesn't beat Arizona, he's got to go. I'm like, what? So, okay, I'm, sometimes it so takes excited. a good, I think a good right. loyal fan who's maybe, you know, has a now outside perspective. Good news we're emotional fans too, so yeah. I understand. Yeah, 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 you got to keep the long term, <laughs> long term in mind. And we're, we're in a privileged position in Boston. We've got Celtics, we've got Bruins, we've got the, the Patriots right on the edge of the playoffs. And, we need the Red Sox to get to yeah, work. Well, we you know, they were last last year, so maybe they're going to win it all like they usually do. So yeah. uh, <laughs> Fingers crossed. That Crazy. Awesome. You know, like last, the worst the first. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you said in Bill We Trust, it sounds like from our conversation in BJ We Trust, from the customers, <laughs> the partners. I hope so. Thank yeah. you so much, BJ, for coming Thank back you. on theCUBE, giving us the lay of the land, what's new, the voice of the customer, and how Palo Alto was really differentiated in the market. We always appreciate your Thank coming you. on the show. Honor and Thanks a privilege. Great to see you right. here. Thanks. You may be thinking that you were watching ESPN just now, but you know we call ourselves the ESPN <laughs> of Tech News. This is Lisa Martin for Dave Vellante and our guest. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live emerging and enterprise tech coverage.